Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Prime Talk. Today I have a really cool guest. I'm having Yoni Kosminski. Uh, Yoni is the founder of Escala and Multiply Me, so two businesses. Um, but the, for the most part, they're a consultancy and a staffing solution focused on uh, the e-commerce and Amazon uh, space and industry. So uh, Yoni, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, my friend and fellow uh, owner of the name Yoni. Good to be here. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for uh, for your time and uh, joining us today. Uh, yeah, this is uh, I can uh, proudly say this is the, you're the first first Yoni beside the Yoni to attend to the show. So this is the Yoni <laughs> and Yoni episode. We kind of uh, behind the scenes we're talking about creating uh, like an M and M's brand, maybe Y and Y brand, uh, other candies or whatever we can to uh, make life sweeter for other people. But today's episode is really going to focus on you. It's going to be the uh, story of Yoni Kosminski. So you're going to uh, share with us, you know, who are you? Where are you from? Where were you born? Where were you raised? Um, how did you enter into the professional world um, and what led you all the way into the e-commerce space? So I guess without further ado, let's jump right into it. Let's do it, mate. All right, go ahead, fire it up. Well, uh, I guess you started off with uh, where am I from? So, I mean, we've had chats before, but uh, for those of you who don't know and, and might be listening in, uh, I'm Australian. Uh, the accent, uh, I hope, is still there because I've done a bit of global travel. So grew up in the... Uh, Main streets of, uh, of Caulfield in Melbourne, uh, Australia. And you say the mean streets? Yeah. I, I'm, yeah you guys I'm are like the nicest piece of people in the world. I find it hard to believe there's mean streets, but if you say so, I believe it. No, definitely not mean streets, mate. I've had, uh, I've had a lot of the uh, <laughs> privileges that you could hope for in, uh, in life. Uh, so no. Um, Glad to hear. Def- so yes, yeah, so I grew up in Melbourne, Australia and um, spent... Uh, my life, I went to, I mean, you know, we've caught up before, but I actually grew up at a, went to a Jewish school in Melbourne, uh, Mount Scopus, and uh, had kind of that formal uh, private school education. So like I said, you know, not, not exactly mean streets. So I've, I've been really gift, gifted and very fortunate in life to not have to worry about some of the things that, you know, people less fortunate are. So yeah, definitely great. You know your origins, for- how your, your family uh, uh, ended up in Australia? Is there a backstory, a backdrop story to that? Yeah, do you know what? Um, well, so I've got, I've got an Israeli father and an Australian mother. And so my grandparents are a real mix. I've got a German, Polish, Australian and Israeli grandmother. So um, Eastern European Jews, um, some of them got out of Germany and migrated to Israel, Poland, I mean, you know, kind of the classic, um, some classic Holocaust survivor stories and how you kind of- So they migrated with... after the war, after the Holocaust or before or during? So my, my parents, my parents were po- post that kind of uh, era, but my grandparents, yeah. yeah, one of them kind of went through the war in Poland. One of them got out of Germany just before she hit the fan. And uh, one of them was actually born in Israel, which is quite rare. So, yeah, kind of a a real mix. The land of Israel before the state of Israel was established in 1948, you mean? So, yes. So, actually, my grandmother was born here. Uh, Her parents migrated here when they were like uh, in about 1925. And my grandfather, yeah, yeah, insane, huh? And my, my, uh, my grandfather who was Polish, actually got here a month before the state of Israel became the state of Israel and left and went to Australia. So if that timeline had shifted, my accent might have sounded very different. Very different. More Israeli, yeah. but yeah. No worries. All right. So uh, born and raised in the mean streets of Melbourne, a privileged uh, life, you know, in a private school, I guess a good, uh, you know, environment, uh, right? A good, um, you know, community, um, you know, and where'd you go to school, I guess? I mean, yeah. after you graduated high school. Yeah, go- yeah. So um, I actually, when I was growing up, I, I always thought that I wanted to be an architect. And so uh, I went down that path and I actually, I, I studied at, at RMIT and it's a What's that? College. What's the acronym? What is that acronym? Oh, you know what? Less interesting acronym. But I think the, the, the thing that's interesting is on the first day that you go and you start your architecture course, they say, look to the left of you look to the right of you, only one of you are going to make it through. And so, <laughs> That's brutal. You know, yeah, it is brutal. And so you're sitting there on the first day, well, at least I was, and I looked to my left, I looked to my right, and I'm thinking these suckers, I'm going to be the one that makes it through. And 
in less than two years, I was just another statistic. So I actually dropped out of architecture and realized but, that uh, the um, school was in Melbourne and uh, your, your area? yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it was in it, it was in Melbourne and I, you I called it R R M I T. What was the acronym? R R M I T. But the 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 university that I did study marketing at that I mm -hmm. after dropping out. I actually moved and did marketing, and that was at Swinburne University of Technology. Swinburne University of Technology, you say? Yeah, close enough. Swinburne. Swinburne. The accent. A Swinburne uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Marketing University. Okay, so wait, let's touch your ears a little bit. Now let's go on to the chronology. So what year did you basically uh, pivot into uh, you know, studying marketing? So that would have been 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 2006, 2007, I got into, into kind of the marketing game and I actually, my first job ever, I was, um, so after graduating, I actually wanted to come, it's funny, I was very kind of like a big believer in, in the state of Israel when I was younger growing up and now the least kind of um, Zionistic, if you will, or, or anything like that, at the least point that I am right now, I actually have lived here for four years, so I'm probably skipping a a few years yeah, ahead. Yeah, here you means uh, yeah you didn't share what I said, but uh, born and raised in, in uh, Melbourne, Australia, but currently uh, residing and living in Israel as an Israeli. Even though the the, the thick Australian accent, which is lovely by the way, is still uh, in your DNA, which is all good, or your tongue. Um, so you're saying uh, in those times, 2007, you know, graduating, uh, uh, you know, getting your marketing degree, you were very passionate about Israel and the land of Israel and the state of Israel, also um, you know, known as Zionism. Correct. Yeah. So that was kind of um, a part of it. I, I wanted to kind of explore the world and Israel just felt like a very natural progression for me, having roots here. My father's from here. And, you know, I grew up very with very fond memories. And, you know, I'll tell you a little bit later on, not to, to give some spoilers about what it's like today, but um, I, I really wanted to get over here. And my parents were just said, you know, first it was just finish a degree. And so I did that. And once I finished my degree, it was all right, I'm still ready to go. And they said, well, just make a bit of money so you can afford to go. And, and I actually went into my first job that wasn't anything related to marketing. It was in, in recruitment, but more so in kind of the hardcore headhunting space. So and this was this 2007. Was this would have been 2008, if I'm not mistaken. Got it. And in that time in 2008, I I actually was, this was kind of pre LinkedIn when LinkedIn is, is what it is today. You know, it was so, sort of just coming up and to kind of headhunt, it was all about your database. It was all about who you knew. And so we actually did some pretty um, questionable stuff to, to get our hands on great candidates. Like I'll never forget one of the tricks that we used to pull, um, we used to call up companies and say, listen, you know, I, uh, I was kind of in the, in the digital or it was the IT space back then. And I'd be looking for, um, you know, project managers and software developers and things of that nature. So what I would do is I would call up these big companies and I'd say, listen, I was speaking to someone in the team, you know, I'm a client, I was speaking to someone in the team yesterday, he was a software engineer. I can't remember his name, but if you told me his name, maybe I'd remember. And so what you'd end up doing is you'd be getting people to kind of rattle off all the names exactly. And, uh, and then I'd say, yeah, it was, uh, it was Ben. And so I'd speak to Ben and I'd give him the opportunity. And then, you know, the next few days you call back and oh, I'd like to speak to Dave. I'd like to speak to Andrew. And that was, what was really, purpose? so you mapped the map. What was the end game for you to do? I was trying to place people. I was trying to find the best talent and place them with our clients. So, I was okay, so let me get people. this straight. Let me get this straight. I forgot the strategy straight. You call a company, let's say Microsoft. Not, you ever, not that you ever did, but you know they have top of the line, top tier software developers. So you want to recruit top of the line software developers for maybe for another organization. So you call it in and say, hey, I had technical difficulties the other day and I, um, uh, I spoke to this, uh, you know, this top, top senior uh, developer. Can you remind me the names? They give you that, 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 that whole list of contact information. Then you just, you know, say, okay, it's this one. So they refer you to him or her. And then you speak and then you forget friendly and then you kind of a pitch an option. Maybe you can work for uh, the competitor called X, Y, Z, maybe more, uh, better salary, better scope, whatever it is. And uh, play the game of talent on and a uh, hijack or a headhunt, uh, you know, um, from top organizations that, that was kind of the elements there. Yeah, that, that was the elements, uh, totally. And I've got to say, I, I lasted, I'm surprised. I lasted a year in that job. Um, it, it wasn't for me. It really wasn't. It, it was, it felt, it just, it felt pretty inauthentic. Um, 
the the kind of the hardcore recruitment when you talk about um when you're placing people from australia in australia all of a sudden everyone kind of look like you know like dollar signs like can i place this person somewhere they have a company i can place people at and it didn't really sit well with me to the point where i had like the, the way it works is you typically get, get paid you know on some of these bigger salaries 20 30 percent of first year annual salary once someone's placed and you we're get talking paid about, as a commission yeah you get paid as a commission so i didn't make all the commission back then but you make you made a pretty significant amount of that so the company right. would make that much and i'd take a big clip but um it kind of got to me where I just thought that it wasn't, it really wasn't for me to the point where I was waiting on like 20 or $30,000 worth of commissions. Cause you've got to wait three months for someone to be in the role before you get paid. And, and I actually left and took up an unpaid internship at a digital agency because I just, I didn't believe in it. It wasn't, it just wasn't my so you're DNA. Saying the money was good, but it was no soul. So you went, you know, to, to, to a new place to kind of reset or pivot, maybe try a new domain. And you even gave a hefty amount of money uh, just to do that because it didn't, you know, fit right in your, uh, in your, your, your soul or your temperament or whatever it is. So you pivoted into. Yeah, I got, I actually got into the digital marketing game in about 2009. Mm -hmm. so, what was the last then? What were we doing? What were we doing it for? Yeah. So I worked at an agency they were called, and they still are called online circle digital. And at that time online circle digital. Yeah. Yeah, online circle digital. Lucio, if you watch this, a shout out. Still got a lot of love for you. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so so I came in and I didn't really know the first thing about uh, everything that was going on, but I knew that I, I was passionate about actually value creation, about how we could actually help brands. I'd studied marketing, so I had kind of, you know, the high level insights of the marketing mix and what was going on and obviously the landscape has changed a ton in the last sort of 10 15 years but what was the, i guess the purpose or your mission inside the the landscape there for um for the organization yeah so so when i joined um i didn't know where i would fit so we were doing solutions we were delivering solutions like seo and ppc facebook media buying when it was just starting off really um content production and strategy and kind of the whole gamut of all things digital and, and how big very, was your organization was it super large or it was kind of mid-sized it was small i was about i was about the 12th employee if i'm not mistaken and tight -knit. i came sorry it's a tight knit it's a more of a kind of a you know close gang totally very, it was it. very small it grew it grew a fair bit while i was there but when I, when I actually started, um, the first account that I ever worked on was Mercedes Benz, Australia, New Zealand. Mm -hmm, nice. So we just won the account as I joined and there was no social media. Um, they didn't have a presence there. So I was actually part of the team that launched Mercedes Benz's uh, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, the works. This was wow. kind of the 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 stepping stones of the kind whole of where, digital marketing infrastructure for this global brand called Mercedes Benz. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, it was a pretty uh, it was a pretty crazy experience. You know, I used to spend a couple of days a week there as the account manager, trying to work with legal, explaining why you can post on social and it's not going to totally backfire. So mm -hmm. that was uh, that was super super interesting, amazing client to work with, and learnt learnt an absolute ton there. Um, and it's funny, like uh, uh, there's a huge company the other brands that i worked with that no one in the u.s knows so i don't even know if it's worth mentioning but mondelez craft foods who has some of the oh, best yeah. chocolate yeah craft is an around. american uh brand at least uh, now they call mondelez but uh, yeah it's a global brand i think it's based out of the u.s if i'm not mistaken maybe in chicago well i mean or no one seems no, i don't know we'll see no one seems to know about cadbury dairy milk or cream egg or boost cadbury? or Fruity frog yeah. yeah, Cadbury is British. Yes, they they also play a little bit in in this market, the U.S. market, but uh, the chocolate, right? It's like a chocolate candy uh, brand. Totally. So, so I guess my my experience in at that agency, and I spent about four years there, was always working with enterprise clients, and we grew from about twelve to thirty five. So, yeah. kind of grew up in that agency, and and really, you know, loved everything I was doing, from kind of helping communicate the brand story and engaging the community and really looking to see how we could add value it's great four years great run global brands uh you know all kind of leaders in their uh, industries 
uh, and you did all the way to 2013-ish, right? And what was the next entry in, uh, for you afterwards? Yeah, so I, I ended up there uh, in 2014, and my next stretch was I, I moved to the US. So I lived in LA for about three years and worked at a creative ad agency in Hollywood called Something Massive. Something Massive. Something Massive, yeah. Sounds Again, like it, yeah. Sounds yeah. Like it. Yeah, so I, that was the whole point at the start. It was a couple, it was three of them. And, you know, the ironic thing is we're something massive and we're just three, but it grew. I was about the 15th employee and again, kind of grew to about 40. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the same sort of thing. I was the senior manager for strategy and engagement, which really is just kind of a long, long winded way of saying that I helped build the strategy pitch decks and, and the digital strategy and, and actually delivered on a lot of the execution work there. So that was. Working it's kind with, of similar to the prior position, just I guess in a, kind of a different marketplace, the U.S. marketplace, maybe a little bit different on the lingo and culture that you got to cater to. But any uh, notable brands? Yeah. So the clients I was working with there, you might have heard of them. Uh, it was Sony, Mastercard. Uh, worked with Snapchat a little bit, uh, Medtronic. So again, big enterprise clients, and the work that we were doing there was, uh, I would say, even kind of high production value. So we were doing everything from you know photo and video content all the way through to tv commercials uh, wow. so, that so yeah was... and i mean you're in uh, california you said la right right so the, definitely the ability to uh, tap into studios and create top of the line you know uh content and video and uh was it uh was it cool that you tested a little bit of hollywood over there yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, we had like 10,000 square feet of production studio downstairs. We had a little area that we're actually building our own sets at times. And yeah, that was uh, that was pretty cool. I got to do some pretty cool live, even all the way through to like live activation work. And um, yeah, you know, working with with MasterCard and flying over to New York, you know, it was all it was all pretty crazy. I was about 27 ish when I got over there. So that was a pretty pretty crazy experience to me you know just a, a guy from melbourne you know had never actually been to the u.s before and ended up moving there you know straight was away there any elements for you of culture shock i know the same kind of language but you know from your own experience was there a culture shock it always looks like a glove it fits you like a glove and you're uh, you know off and running as soon as you hit the, the the ground do you know what i would say it takes it really takes it took me some time um i would say the first six months firstly I mean, now you're saying, you know, great accent, you, you, you can hear me. When I first walked in and no one could understand a word I was saying. Really? Like, that, yeah. I mean, I, like one of the one of the stories that I always find so funny is that when I used to sit like the closest, when we were at the first location, just on Wilshire, uh, I was the first, I was the closest person to the door. And so I was kind of the first face that everyone would see. So, you know, nice polite guy people would walk in and, and i would just say yeah the doorman i was the doorman i was the doorman i loved it right. and so people would walk in and and i would you know my natural inclination was to just kind of try and be helpful and i would always say like can can i get you a glass of water and <laughs> and they would look at me i mean it's, it's softened now and so what ended oh, up right. happening was i'm like water water and then <laughs> you know you you, you you say you say it enough times and i feel like it's kind of softened my accent and now i mean at least you're laughing and people understand me so that's uh that's a good thing right well they, yeah i mean i understand you completely just the, what the people th thought you're threatening them or what was the reaction when were you trying they're to say just like, uh, they just, just said that. it's that's not a word like what are you what are you trying to <laughs> what are you trying to do i'm, I'm uh, trying to I'm, you know i'm trying to meet with the owners yeah, very, very cute. Very, yeah. Culture shock of an Australian. I never thought about that. And especially not of a basic uh, word like wa or water. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very so, cool. Yeah, so, so it was definitely, uh, there was definitely some, you know, early learnings. But I think, you know, after, after probably a year, like for me, you know, I've lived in a few cities now and it, it takes you a good year to find your feet. And then I would say like, once you hit that two, two and a half year mark, that's when you really have a, a deep kind of appreciation and understanding for, kind of the, the, the true culture and, and, and what's going on. And I've got a deep love for LA and for the US and- In a quick yeah. nutshell, if you can, on the society, or I guess anthrop anthropological level, the main main differences you find between the Australian culture and American culture, I never really thought uh, to, to kind of uh, hit that angle, but uh, I'll take you as an experiment. So uh, what's your take uh, on that? 
there's a, there's a lot of things that I can say. On a yeah. quick touch, yeah, just on a quick yeah. touch. Yeah, yeah. Really on a quick touch, I think that, um, and it also it also depends when you talk about America. It's a huge country, like East Coast versus West Coast, very very different kind of vibe. But yeah, full least... disclosure, never been to LA, so I'm very curious because you know, for me, it's like being in Australia. LA. It's all the way over there. You know, it's across the land. Yeah, guys, so, what, what'd you find? So I'd say that uh, uh, Australia is probably a little bit more laid back and easy going and, and maybe a little bit more direct where in, in my experience in the US, it was kind of like skimming around the edges and, and being a little bit more cautious as to kind of what you're saying and what's going on. There was, I mean, again, I was working in Hollywood, you know, it's all about image. So um, I think that had a pretty profound kind of experience or, or, or impact on how I saw people. But um, if there's one thing that I will say, and I have become victim to it is consumerism. You know, once you have once you have Amazon and you have same day delivery, you know you can't see the world the same. It's it's changed forever. Yeah, I hear you. That's where we're all gathered here today, folks. You know, the world of e-commerce slash Amazon is just a world that is uh, magnificent. It's very powerful, very impactful. It creates uh, for the consumer a lot of you know uh, options to uh, get delighted, uh, but also for the the entrepreneurs to uh, you know offer their uh, their products, goods, and solutions. Uh, and, and indulge and interact. So, all right, very cool. So you did it up to, uh, you know, from around 2014 all the way up to about 2017. Uh, you tasted the, you know, the professional world in the United States, obviously the culture and the consumerism. But 2017, what's your next station? What was the next, uh, you know, progression for you? Yeah, so I was sponsored professionally in the US. I uh, didn't have a green card or anything like that. So I was tied to the job and I had to kind of make a decision. Do I keep pushing forward? or do I kind of consider my options? And for me, um, again, I, I kind of got itchy feet and I wanted to see what else was out there, what else, what other value I could create, what else I could do. And, and I actually came to Israel, um, I wouldn't say on a whim, uh, but I came just for a visit. You know, I hadn't been in many years, I hadn't seen, I've, I've got a grandmother that lives here and an uncle and, you know, family here. So I hadn't been here for many years. I hadn't really had a, had a break. You want to talk about US culture. I mean, you get 10 days off a year. And in that 10 days, I used to go back to Australia. And for anyone who lives away from home, going home is not a, uh, it's not a holiday. Let's, let's put it that way. So, you know, so yeah, everyone wants to see you. It's, it's, it's intense. So uh, I was probably feeling a little bit burnt out, came to, to Israel and probably two days into being here, I just said, there's just no way I'm leaving. The really? City. Well, this is 2017? Yeah, this was May 2017. Yeah, what was the effect? What happened to you in those two days? So, my cousin, who, who actually grew up in Jersey, had just finished... Um, Jersey, New uh, Jersey, United States? Yeah, New Jersey, United States. Because yeah, yeah. also Jersey Island in England somewhere, I know. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so United States. He'd actually finished... Um, he was in an elite combat unit in the army here, and he'd just finished... Um, which one? Know you know name? He was in. Uh, I'll give some perspective if I if I can. If I yeah, I, I I can't. You know what? He's gonna be. Uh, he's gonna be upset with me that I'm not remembering it. Um, it right, goes. Right. He was in Egos. Got it. So yeah, this is infantry. That's a commando unit established for. Um, actually, uh, originally established to fight in the northern border border with, mm -hmm. um, you know, Hezbollah. So they're very good at camouflaging and guerrilla warfare. So that's where he served uh, the time in his army. Okay, so what was his deal there? What happened? So you can help me because I don't know how you'd say this exactly in English, but it, I went, my first day in Israel, I went to his Sof Maslul. Got it. So yeah, so essentially when you, it's harsh training, they go through a like, crazy amount of, uh, and a very long uh, uh, harsh training. And, and towards the end of the training, they do some sort of um, um, a ceremony where they, uh, they, they finish the, 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 the training. And then, you know, families are able to come in and, um, and participate in the ceremony and uh that's when you kind of uh, uh came and engaged and saw i guess the culture a little bit uh at least on yeah. the army side yeah and the values so that was that was a pretty powerful experience and then you know i'm not going to say that's what kept me here yeah. i mean you've you've been to tel aviv before uh, you know clearly uh the city really just took me it is it's incredible um it's open uh, it's fresh it's uh it's colorful it's uh, it's everything, right? It's uh, kind of it's uh, it's like the the New Yorker visual, just the weather is extremely better. You got it's uh, mostly <laughs> sunny all year. Uh, plus, you got the beach, fabulous beach. Uh, you know, just great vibes, great great culture, great drinking, great eating, great everything. So 
the best of the world uh, at the palm of your hand in a way. So that, that, yeah. that's what compelled you in. Definitely. I mean, you know, just to kind of um, reiterate what you're saying, like, you know, you've got a city that's tiny, you've got a million people in very close proximity, you know, maybe four square miles, I would guess, where, mm -hmm. you know, you can walk everywhere, you're on the Mediterranean, the, the culinary scene here is just next level, the produce is unbelievable. And it's this kind of, kind of crazy juxtap juxtaposition of having like, this old world, like down the street in Jaffa, you've got literally like, thousand buildings that are thousands of years old mixed with you know i think tel aviv was one of the most funded uh cities in the world last year i think they brought in like eight or nine billion dollars in seed funding so you've got this just crazy mix of like high-tech technology and platforms and solutions meets this old world kind of mentality and nothing makes sense but everything yeah. makes sense all at the same time Got it. Uh, yeah, I never really thought about all that uh, bundling of uh, new world and uh, old world, uh, all under great food and great drinking and just great weather. So it makes it very, very compelling and enticing. Uh, very cool. So 2017, you find yourself, uh, I guess, you know, captured by, by, uh, by the land. So you decide to stay. And uh, professionally, what was your next step? Yeah, so I took a little bit of time off initially uh, just to kind of collect my thoughts and decide what I wanted to do and kind of scoped out the landscape. But to before I do anything, there's always a, a long planning stage um, that goes into it. And so I met with a ton of agencies and creative businesses and kind of got a feel for where the pulse was in terms of the, the evolution of the space. And um, I wasn't particularly impressed. Um, I just felt like there wasn't anything that was so captivating. And I think that was kind of my, my next move was that I wasn't prepared to, I wasn't prepared to work for any of these companies where I knew that the work that I'd done was at a higher level, you know, so you're saying expensive. on the marketing end, right? With your marketing experience, you know, t working with top global brands all these years, you come there, you kind of pick into the scene, you say, okay, there's something going on, but I'm already um, too mature for this, all right? Or too experienced for this. So you're not too compelled, immediately compelled to jump, jump into that swamp. So uh, what was, so what did you do? So I ended up starting my own agency. Uh, mm. So I had my own agency for, for a minute there and it was going great. Um, picked up clients pretty quickly, just obviously given the experience and the stuff that I ha had done. And it just, it really wasn't fulfilling for me. I felt that I'd kind of been there and done that. That was the third or fourth time I'd gone down that agency route. And I was also doing it solo. Like I also realized like the solopreneur route is not me. Um, I love to have people to bounce ideas off and, um, you know, you, you deal with a lot going through building a business and trying to go down all these paths and, you know, to do it solo is just that added kind of harsh, you know, that harsh kind of reality that you have to kind of take everything on yourself. So. Yeah, yeah, you're in the terrain and uh, you got to fight for your life every single moment, every, every single day. And uh, you, I guess you found out if you do have partnerships uh, or a good partner in place, probably can reach a further destination. So it sounds like, okay, you had to stay with uh, marketing and you pivot into where I have a feeling that Amazon is going to come into the mix at some point. You took, you took the words right out of my, uh, <laughs> right out of my mouth. Yeah. Um, do you, I feel like you know my story better than I do now. Um, uh, so, so I, I actually met a couple of guys. So I was at a point where I said, you know what? I know I can do this marketing thing that I've got down. You know, I was doing everything from buying Facebook media for clients and, you know, I'm spending a hundred K and generating 1.4, 1 1.5 in, you know, in, in returns. And I just said, like, it doesn't make sense. If I simply had the product at my disposal, and I could deliver on what I'm delivering on, then why am I, you know, why am I kind of, you know, to, for lack of a better term, but why am I making idiots rich here, if they simply would give me all of the insights and not just let me do one aspect of the marketing mix, I could really turn things on its head. So I actually started to look for partners who had kind of supply chain and logistics uh done so that i could take on the oh, market so you should tell yourself oh these these brand owners right why am i uh basically helping these brands grow in sales and you know become you know, wealthy and rich uh why don't i actually do a, some sort of ver vertical integration i will be part of a brand i have a stake in it and i'll be able to uh to position it in, in the digital sphere at least and market it so it generate sales and volume and then you know wealth that was kind exactly of that was the mindset is that I could, I, I bring X to the table. If someone can bring Y, then we can do some real things together. If I can have real, uh, if I can give real direction as to the whole mix here and not just get, give like, you know, you come to an agency and at the end of the day, like 
and agencies are, are high value and you know i have a lot of respect for agency owners and what they do um but the reality is that you know you're still at their discretion of how much they bring you in or don't bring you in and if they change their position on what the marketing mix looks like you know you're in and you're out and for me that wasn't um i wanted to have more impact yep. i wanted to really kind of build the plan and, and be able to execute it too so That's i actually awesome. met a, i met a couple of guys and i didn't realize kind of the magnitude of their business because they were literally like two three guys that were running around running an amazon business and uh, we spoke for a long time and it's probably a, a conversation for another time but i ended up joining this company this is um, 2017 already crossed into 18. this is 2018. okay so this is 2018. so i joined that company and you know i obviously had a lot of skills that these guys were missing and they had a, a two million dollar amazon operation and in the span of about 12 months i was able to build the infrastructure and scale that from two to five million in in about a, a 12 month period right, but the infrastructure when you say infrastructure the the marketing infrastructure or everything the whole operation is top to bottom yeah it was the entire operation because mm -hmm. what they lacked was any form of process or clarity on responsibility and role it was like literally kind of like a lot of um you know owner operators in the amazon space probably doing around that much like you can you can get to a point where you'll jump into seller central and you'll figure out what's going on. Is the flag gone up? Okay, I've got to deal with some shit. All of a sudden you move on and I'm checking my PPC reports and I'm trying to understand what's shifted. And, you know, before you know it, you know, you can get through it, but you know, it's a very different beast at, you know, a million, two million to five, six, seven, ten million 10 million plus. You, you, can't, you can't have that level of control from, you know, an owner operator. And if you do, you're probably making a lot of money, but I don't know if it's worth it for the, the lack of sleep or kind of, mm. you know, attention you the can grind, give on yeah. it. Yeah, the grind yeah. that you have to put into the mix. Um, got it. So you help with the SOPs, standardize things, create a structure, create a flow, so things can really uh, uh, scale properly and smoothly and with room for more. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, built the team out in the Philippines, um, had some real kind of aha moments then as well. I, I hired a, a recruiter and it, you know, it really kind of set things into to place where, you know, I knew who I needed to hire. I knew what a great developer, designer, content writer, keyword researcher, logistics, supply. I knew all the key players and I would spend 20, 30 hours a week trying to search for them myself. And when I hired a recruiter, everything changed. I would spend two, you know, two or three hours in a final round interview and I'd hire two out of three people. And so that was a real kind of light bulb moment, not only of how to really impact scale, but bringing in true professionals into every aspect of the business. and. And I also kind of, you know, I'd already worked with the Philippines for several years, but that was kind of, the, I would say like the start of my love affair for kind of the culture and the people and kind of the capacity and ability that exists inside of the Philippines. And so um, not, not a story for now, but I walked away, uh, even though I was, I was owner of that business, I walked away from it in 2019. So and about a year, almost two years into the mix. What well, was late to, yeah, it was late. So, 12 to 18 months i'm yep. not exactly sure but yeah it was about 12 to 18 months that i that i kind of left mm -hmm. and that business was actually just recently sold to um to one of the big boys in the space who are acquiring everything yep. and i realized that what what myself and the team that i took with me were able to achieve there uh it was game changing for these guys because they got their lives back they were actually able to to kind of breathe and create scale and uh, you know ultimately they sold the business so it you know it really kind of was the proving ground and the proof of concept that i needed to say that if this was kind of game changing for these guys it'd be life changing for other people and that's kind of the day i walked away from that business was the day that i started building multiply mean scala and yeah that was back in september october of 2019 right that that i went to to work on on the idea that, that is now, right, so you uh, created, essentially created two tracks. One of them is a Scala and one of them is multiply me. So that's kind of where the tracks that you're still in uh, and involved now. So take us through it. I guess talk a little bit about a Scala, the purpose, the mission, and, uh, and then the same thing for multiply me. So, you know, our audience and listeners can understand uh, what's going on, what's the value. Yeah. Well, just, just because I've spoken to you a little bit, uh, offline, you know, in the chats that we've had, you know, I know that you're a real person and that, you, you know, you, you, you have a deep kind of, care and connection for people and it's not honestly 
it's not the angle that I always share with people, but in all honesty, when I was working uh, at the last company, we were paying, we were paying our top people like six, $7 an hour. And as in, in the Philippines and, you know, for me, um, call it ignorance. Cause it was, um, I thought that was a good salary. And so I actually asked my COO, um, now today, you know, what were you making and tell me unapologetically, what were you making at your highest when you were working in a corporate job? She used to wrap companies up effectively for sale. Like she's Hold uh, on, your COO in the, in the Scala or the previous company? No, in this company. So she was a, she came this in company as a project. Scala, right? Yeah. So she's across both the Scala and, and multiply, multiply me, me she's, but and she's the COO when she's based out of where in, in Israel, U S uh, Philippines, Philippines. She's out of the Philippines. Okay, we need some context to understand the, the value. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, so like I said, she was she was getting paid seven dollars an hour with us, and I asked her unapologetically, and she said, you know, at my peak in the corporate world, I was making I think it was like three or three and a half thousand dollars a month, which I think translates to about twenty, twenty one, twenty two dollars an hour. Um, okay. And what I realized in that moment was that you know you have all these businesses kind of externally who. And, and call it, you know, there's like onlinejobs.ph, which, you know, I don't know if, how familiar you are with it, but you can set your, you can set your um, salaries to like one and $2. So just like sometimes with Amazon products, it feels like a bit of a race to the bottom mm -hmm. and people are willing to kind of go low. So there was a social mission attached to Multiply Me and kind of what we do as a business is that we, we really care about the salaries of the employees and so we pay healthcare, social security, HMO, PhilHealth, 13th month and Pagibig. We do, we operate more like a Filipino company in terms of how we deliver value to the, to the team members than we do kind of the traditional Western world because that's the whole thing is like, if you want to really understand a country and a culture, you have to really get down on that level and, and have a deep understanding. So when we started it, that was really kind of a driving factor as well. So when I look at like success and uh, you know, I know we've been kind of seeing each other around Clubhouse a little bit and you're seeing all these rooms popping up and everyone's talking about, you know, six, seven, eight figures and 10 million figures and all these kind of chat rooms. And for me, success has really been driven by the number of jobs that we can create or be involved in creating that for me. is the prosperity, kind of the prosperity around uh, the entire industry, of course, the end goal for you know, is to make profit and as much as possible. Uh, and that usually get generated on those higher levels of uh, earnings, which is seven, eight, nine figures. Uh, but your um, your mission is more about okay, that's great, but what's inside of it? What kind of positive impact can society have? Can the global economy have? You know, other regions might have. Uh, so it trickles down into the purpose of multiply me, but also scala. But what's the difference? You know, anybody listening to this, okay, um, what's this for? What's that for? Is you know, this is a hammer, this is a nail. Pretty clear. Both help you to to build something but what's the purpose of each one? Yeah, yeah I love how you phrase that. Um, so with Multiply Me, uh, we'd be classified as like a white glove end-to-end -end recruitment and HR function um, into the Philippines, finding you know serious professionals in the e-commerce and Amazon space where we're placing roles like inventory and logistics managers, ops managers, PPC and AdWords specialists everything keyword research kind of at every level, um, but not your classic and, you know, the term gets thrown around a lot, VA. Um, I really, I don't love that term. And, yeah, and for a uh, virtual assistant, yeah, the, the acronym, yeah. Yeah, the acronym virtual assistant. And, and I don't love it because what ends up happening is that you find kind of lower grade people who you effectively ruin their careers because if someone's good at a bit of WordPress, a bit of InDesign, a bit of Photoshop can, code a little bit like you, you know you're a you're a jack of all trades but a master of none and so what we want to do and obviously at the end of the day you're saving a, a lot of money working with highly skilled filipinos in comparison to working with onshore talent so obviously the value is there for the clients but the reason i'm kind of going the the point of our kind of employees and team members is because like that was that the you know i think like purpose built businesses are always going to have, um, they're going to be a lot more prosperous because you actually care and you stand behind. It's very easy for me to get up in the morning and know that we're actually having impact. And I know in the last business that I worked with, you know, we were selling products that I didn't particularly care about. It wasn't like a, a passion project for me. It was, it was colder. It was much colder. You find more purpose and more soul in, in the position you are now. For me, it's a little bit interesting how you're able to kind of um, have um, 
uh, uh, closure with uh, how you begin uh, be- began your professional career with headhunting talent, right? Two thousand eight, two thousand nine, you're headhunting, you know, uh, for for us uh, for uh, for uh, talent for you know for uh, industry or certain industries, and now you kind of do the same thing, and now it's for the industry of Amazon sellers, but now you have a personal, real, normal, authentic connection with the talent, and you're pampering it, you're developing it, so you have a whole kind of um, evolution there where you're connecting to the past, but you're creating a much better environment, uh, which is much more sustainable and much more uh, impactful, uh, which is, I think, a unique uh, evolution that happened in your story. Um, and this is really, like you're mentioning, the purpose of Multiply Me, where there's a pool of talent that you guys create for you know, sake of e-commerce sellers, Amazon sellers, where it's reliable, it's consistent, it's healthy, it's good, and it's, um, and it's a high level, high grade. And what's the purpose of a scholar for, for that matter? Yeah. And so just to close off on Multiply Me, and it's kind of, I'm telling you the story this way, because this is kind of the chronology of how I understood the value creation in the business that was sold was that we built the team and the team with the engine room that really drove the growth and the prosperity of that business. But that was only possible to scale when we actually built the infrastructure to allow that to, to exist. So what we did was, and, and you know, I'll, I'll go on a limb here and, and say, I think we're world first here in what we're doing inside of Escala because what we're doing in Multiply Me, you know, I'm always gonna argue that we're doing things smarter, better uh, than, you know, some of the other companies that play in this space. And we are focused on this kind of niche of the Amazon and e-commerce sellers. But with Escala, it's, it's a management consulting practice focused on process improvement. Again, centered around Amazon and e-commerce. So just to kind of, give you um, give you an idea or give you some context and you know your listeners will be at all different levels um, a lot of people when they're kind of running through their business and they're running through their Amazon businesses at all different levels you know I think that a lot of the times things feel like they're on fire all the time you know you come into Q4 and you're a big Q4 product and you know things are all going uh, crazy you, you don't know where to look you're just kind of hoping that you get you stay up you get through the the season and you move on and you know, you'll ask a lot of business owners in the space, like, you know, how do you do this? How do you that? And, and they'll be able to recite verbatim every single process that they do, but none of it is actually committed outside of their brain. And so, you know, I guess the logic behind Escala as a business is that, you know, if you, for whatever reason, didn't come back to work the next day, what happens to the business, you know? Mm-hmm. And you can even ladder that up into saying, if you're trying to sell your company to, you know, the operational infrastructure is absolutely key in, in, in getting effective deal um, deals going. So what we do inside of that is we have a team of about 12 to 15 X EY Accenture and BCG consultants. And what we're doing inside of what there. Was that? What it, was those acronyms? Sorry, I thought, I thought I missed that. I think I missed that. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Accenture, EY is Ernst & Young. And it's the big four consulting companies. So a lot of them leverage talent overseas. So we built a team in the Philippines, mm. leveraging X big four consultants, where what we did was we built our own process and maturity framework and methodology around the e-commerce and Amazon space. So what we effectively do in that business is we come in and we'll assess what's actually happening. So we build out the current state process maps and we look at the maturity framework and we look at companies holistically against people, process, systems and technology and we have our own grading system and at the back of that grading system we can make a whole slew of recommendations on how you can improve your process reduce drag get rid of bottlenecks and and build for actual operational growth you know what does your staffing requirements look like what are your gearing ratios as you're trying to scale and what we'll do is we'll build out all the process maps and we'll then build out the future state of what the company should look like to be efficient we'll build out things like you know for every for every thousand product SKUs, you're going to need a new um, inventory and logistics manager and you're going to need two more keyword researchers and you'll need a graphic designer. So we work on making ways because it's very easy, especially when you look at the growth of Amazon and how quickly things come up in the space. You can always throw money at the problem and money is typically translated into people or technology, but it's not the most effective way to scale. You know, people, the, the, the word scale is thrown around a lot, but a lot of people actually just experience growth. So what we're trying to achieve here is true scale. It's not about investing a heap more money. It's about doing it intelligently at the times that you need it. Yeah, let me let me try to get this straight. So before I dive into what I understand from this, if I was you know if I was to be a surrogate of an Amazon seller, uh, uh, the name of Scholar is a tribute to the word scale. By the way, yes. Trying you to speak scale Spanish. I do. Yeah. I do speak Spanish. Yeah. There you uh, go. 
Okay, just a, a little touch on that. Okay, so um, if I'm an Amazon seller, I do, let's say, five, roughly $5 million a year in revenue. But, you know, my ambition is to grow into 10, 15, 20, and beyond, right? So I come to Scala. They come in and do a deep dive. I'm telling you, this is where you are now. Okay, this is the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? But now mm -hmm. if you want to grow into the 15 or 20 million mark, for example, this is what you should be doing. Uh, the, you know, create the structures. And this is the employees you have now, but this is, might be the employees or roles you might have to need in the future. So it's a whole roadmap and a game plan on a very strategic high level. Uh, but, it, you know, from top to bottom, it's very detailed. Uh, so you can really follow it and have, you know, uh, an ability to do uh, uh, your, your, um, your operation in a way that it's, it's tailored towards growth. It's, it's calibrated and uh, it's smoother. So you don't have to uh, take a lot, uh, you know, take a, a lot out of the guessing. Like you said, also, if you are, if you ever get removed from the business for whatever reason, it could be happy, it could be tragic. There's a system. There's always a, somebody else that comes in and you can be replaced. And it's, it's a good thing. Or, and Sam, because let's say you got hurt, you're in bed for a few months or even a year, God forbid, right? Business still runs, still provides income. So your whole business, which is your ultimate money making machine, it's a machine, right? It's a system. So if it only depends on one person, uh, it's good and bad, but mostly it's not so good because if, if something happens to that person, everybody around gets affected, including that person. So if you come in and you're able to really build an infrastructure that it's uh, organized, it's structured, and it just you know can be in a, almost a position where it's automated, it's, uh, it's an autopilot, but also leaves room and vision to growth. Uh, it's a great combination towards you know uh, moving in this terrain, which can be really tough, really super hyper dynamic, and not so uh, stable at times. So. This is kind of the approach of Escala. I mean, you, you've really, uh, you've done great work there, Yanni. I'm, uh, I'm impressed. Yeah, that's, that's it. So, you know, everything all the way down to building out the standard operating procedures, training videos, all the documentation that exists. So, you know, when, we, when you were mentioning before, like about kind of having that, um, that passive income, essentially, where, you know, you get to decide what you want to do and what you don't want to do. And, you know, there are some massive upsides when you talk about the ability to exit a business, you know, uh, we won't get into 100%. that talk, you know, right. into, into too much detail here, but the reality is like, that's, that's going to be one key component of what people are looking for is how important are the key personnel, because they're not going to stick around, you know, it depends on the deal structure that you have going, but typically speaking, you know, people are looking for that big payday. So this is a way that you can kind of help shore up the valuation, potentially increase your multiple and, and also kind of, reduce that transition period. So it's, it's definitely, um, it's, you, you definitely hit the nail on the head. Got it. Thank you. All right. Very good. All right. So I think we have a good uh, idea of, I uh, you know the, the purpose and value of multiply me and Escala, and this is where you are now. Uh, so uh, before we kind of close the episode, let's touch a little bit of a bit of a recap of your story. Uh, born and raised in Melbourne, you know, attended, uh, attended a private school, went to school for architecture, dropped out, pivoted into marketing, uh, got your first job out of a college instead of marketing head, head hunting. Uh, then I did it for about a year, uh, I dived into a marketing, the real world of marketing uh, for uh, you know, about five to six years. Uh, you know, got some big clients, Mercedes was one of them. Then you shifted, uh, you packaged your stuff into the US, to LA, did about three years there. Also worked with top uh, level clients like Sony. Um, and then uh, 2017 on a visit in Israel, a few days you got captured into the mix. So um, you stayed and um, uh, instead of uh, you know, joining it to the the, the, the fray of marketing, you tried something on your own for a little stint, but then you stumbled upon the world of Amazon and Amazon sellers because you realized, you know, having a stake in the game and also pushing it towards success is something that you're more interested in and not just having a stake in uh, the digital and marketing side of it. Uh, so you did that for 12 to eight months, uh, which led you uh, to great success in, in organi on the organizational scale from 2 million raised to about 5 million, million plus, which is pretty dramatic in such a short run. Uh, which uh, created the, the, you know, these two uh, tracks for you, uh, Multiply Me and Escala, which is really focusing on growth, sustainability, uh, creating uh, prosperity you know, uh, to uh, organizations, the ones that you are running, but also the ones you're helping. Uh, that's kind of the purpose and the mission. So this is the body of the story. Uh, we appreciate it so much that you share with us. It has been uh, fascinating. I learned a few things, so thank you for that. All right, so now that we're going to close up the episode, I uh, want to touch two things. The first thing will be is, um, if somebody wants to reach out to you and connect, where can they find you? And the last thing will be, um, what is your message of hope and inspiration for entrepreneurs listening out there? Yeah. So before I touch on my, how people can get in touch and, and my message, you have to have the best memory I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. How on earth did you do that? 
I listen, yep. you know, when you listen, I listen. That's it. it just uh, it gets stored in the database. I just have to pull it out real quick just to make sure everybody's on the same page before we, we uh, sign off. That is an impressive talent, my friend. You, you again, going to keep Thank using you, yeah. the nail on the head here. But um, if anyone wants to get in touch, if they're watching this, um, feel free to email me directly, Yoni at multiply me, M double I dot com. Um, you can check out our website, be able to find me there too. Uh, also, Escala or Yoni at weareescala.com. So, a million ways to, to get me or find me in Clubhouse at Yon Cos. Um, and my message to aspiring entrepreneurs, I would say I'm going to go against some of the things that I've been listening to um, this week. And I'll say two things. Uh, one is that I think that some of the most valuable years uh, and some of the best advice that I got while I was growing up in business is that learn on someone else's dime. You know, it took me a long time to kind of get to where I am. And, you know, I always kind of believed I had the potential, but I waited, I waited a long time. I waited probably 10 years before I kind of really started to go it, not alone, but to, to go off on, on myself. And, you know, and I, I lived a great life until now. And, you know, the, the, the journey, the entrepreneurial journey, it's not as sexy as people always think that it is, you know, like your salary isn't what it should be. And it's, it's tough taking steps back. So I'm just saying, make sure you're ready to kind of take that path. And, and then conversely to that, I'd say that, you know, the, the, the hardest part is just starting, you know, just get moving and, and, and go forward. Once you're confident in what you can deliver, once you know that you've got to build the plan, take a second, but, but keep pushing forward. Don't, don't, don't kind of think because, you know, ideas are a dime a dozen, but it's all about execution. It's all about taking action and follow through. That's really what kind of sets you know, the, the, the aspiring entrepreneurs apart is, is how much do you want it and how much are you going to kind of put that time in to make things happen? Got it. If I can wrap it up, I would say, um, you know, take your time to learn, even if it's somebody else's dime, uh, learn and learn well. But once you set it off, start and you start, just keep coming at it, be, you know, uh, be persistent and uh, keep at, you know, you know, uh, pushing at your targets and gold goals uh beautiful thank you uh yoni so much for uh you know uh, participating in the episode today i enjoyed it uh, so much i hope everybody else uh, enjoyed it uh, who listened it uh, and got here so far um uh, i wish everybody uh, the best of health and happiness and uh, until next time take care thank you for having me my friend